I was um, raped when I was nine by a cousin and never told anybody until I was in my late 20s. Not only was I raped by a cousin, I was raped by a cousin and then later sexually molested by a friend of the family and then by an uncle. It was just an ongoing continuous thing. So much so that I started to think, you know, this is the way life is. As a result of that, got myself into a lot of trouble and believed that I was responsible for it. It wasn't until I was 36 years old, 36, that I connected the fact, oh, that's why I was that way. I always blamed myself. Even though intellectually I would say to other kids, I would speak to people and say, oh, the child is never to blame. You're never responsible for molestation in your life. I still believed I was responsible somehow, that I was a bad girl. The same thing that in some cases causes a child to be abused is the same thing that causes you to be abused as an adult, is the same thing that in your adulthood that allows you to never be able to say no to people. And I realized that I was the kind of child who was always searching for, for love and affection and attention. Unfortunately, there are adults who will take advantage of that and misread your intentions. Part of the process for me as an adult has been to come to recognize that my inability as an adult female to say no is the same thing that caused me to be victimized as a child. Many times I would get myself into situations as an adult where I didn't want to say no because I didn't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I didn't want to say no because I didn't want anybody angry with me. I didn't want to say no because I don't want people to think I'm not nice. And it, that to me has been the greatest lesson of my life is to recognize that I am solely responsible for it and not trying to please other people, not living my life to please other people, but doing what my heart says all the time. That's the biggest lesson. You know, the other big lesson for me has been to learn not only do you have the right to do whatever you want, you have the right to change your mind. Like I'd say, oh, but I, I have to because I said I was going to do it. And, and then later you think about it and you realize I shouldn't be doing this, but I said I was going to do it and I don't want to make anybody upset. It's taken me 37 years to figure that out, to get that straight. I think, oh my goodness, if I had learned this 20 years ago, all the time I could have saved. Look where I could have been. Look, I don't know if men have this problem. I think men who are for instance, abused sexually or physically, that it manifests outwardly in some way, that their anger and their rage takes on an, a different kind of direction. I think women to a great extent, and I know many, many women who were sexually abused, internalize it and then allow themselves to abuse themselves later on in life. You know, you just don't allow yourself to be all that you can be. Whereas a man will, will make it more external and will be angrier. I don't believe that anything happens without a reason. And in order to believe that is the truth, you have to believe it in all circumstances. If you're going to take responsibility for your life, then you have to take it in, in all forms. I certainly wish that I had been the kind of child who told the first time. And so because I wasn't the kind of child who did that, a part of my mission in life now is to encourage every other child who's abused. You tell, you tell, and if they don't believe you, you keep telling, you tell everybody until somebody listens to you. If nothing else, that's part of something good that came out of that experience for me. Because I don't want it to happen to another child. I don't want another child to be afraid of, of saying, this is what happened to me. I was living with my mother and living under circumstances that a lot of young children have to deal with today. And if you'd asked me at the time if we were poor, I probably would have said no, because when you are living it and you don't know anything else, you think that's the way life is. I think that success is a process. And I believe that my first Easter speech at the age of three and a half was the beginning. And that every other speech, every other book I read, every other time I spoke in public was a building block. So that by the time I first sat down to audition in front of a television camera, what allowed me to read it so comfortably and be so at ease with myself at that time was the fact that I'd been doing it a while. If I'd never read a book, or I'd never spoken in public before, I would have been traumatized by it. So the fact that we went on the air with the Oprah Winfrey show in 1986 nationally, well, it's because I've been being myself since I was 19. I would not have been able to be as comfortable with myself had I not made mistakes on the air and been allowed to make mistakes on the air and understand that it doesn't matter. There's no such thing to me as an embarrassing moment. If I tripped and fell, if my bra strap showed, if I fell flat on my face, there's no such thing as an embarrassing moment because I know that there is not a moment that I could possibly experience on the air 
that somebody else hasn't already experienced. It's no big deal. I can't be embarrassed. I can't be embarrassed. You can laugh at yourself and you can make a mistake and it's not the end of the world. You don't have to be perfect. I truly believe that thoughts are the greatest vehicle to change power and success in the world. Everything begins with thoughts. I mean, the chairs that we're sitting in, the room that we're in, all started because somebody thought it. I thought up the color purple for myself. I read the book. When I heard that there was going to be a movie, I started talking it up for myself. I felt it so intensely that I had to be a part of that movie. I really do believe I created it for myself. I wanted it more than anything in the world and would have done anything to do it. It was all, I think, a part of the process of, of growth for me to recognize it can be done. I had done a movie called Beloved, a book written by Toni Morrison. I worked on that movie for 10 years and then it came out and it bombed. For the longest time, when I would read people say, read that people had said it was a bomb, I would get like, oh, clutched because I couldn't even say the word bomb. I couldn't say it failed. It was, it felt like at the time, one of the biggest you know, disasters of my career. It felt like the saddest thing. It sent me into depression. And what I learned from that experience is what we talk about in right. the book, is you take the, the thing that was the worst thing for you, the thing that was the challenge, and you begin to look at what it was that you really benefited or how you benefited from that thing. And what I learned from that beloved experience, because at the time that it bombed. I went into depression about it. My former depression was eating macaroni and cheese for breakfast every morning. And about 40 pounds later, I was talking to a friend and they were saying, so why did this take you down so? And I said, because I just wanted everybody to feel about that movie the way I felt about it. I wanted people to understand that you could be an enslaved person, come through that and still have love. And the person said to me, well, I felt that. I said, well, I actually wanted millions of people, <laughs> not, not, not just you. And then I decided that from all of my work going forward, and that was in 1998 when it bombed, I would no longer be attached to the work. I would allow myself to detach from it and just offer whatever I was doing, offer it. I say, this is what I'm doing. This is what I would love for you to receive it in the manner in which I'm giving it. If you don't receive that, then the joy for me was in the giving of it. This is the other thing I, I think that's really important and I've come to on my own. I just realized that you reach a point where you have to ask yourself, what is enough? What is enough? And, you know, I live a really huge life surrounded by, and it was actually a goal of mine when I was first doing the color purple in 1985. I remember writing in my journal then that if I ever get enough money, I want a house surrounded by beautiful things. And so I have done that. I have achieved that over and then over and then over. And I look around and I say, okay, you got enough. It's okay. I'm satisfied. I have all the things that I need. And so now I can focus on how do I take what I know, what I've gained, who I've become in the world, and how can I use that in service to other people in a way that makes them happier. And that for me, that's part of what this book is about. This is the thing. I remember years ago, during the beloved period actually, when I was being interviewed by a reporter and then about a decade later, I ran into the same reporter. I didn't remember her, but she remembered me. And she said, yeah, I remembered you. I interviewed you during the beloved. I said, oh, that was a time. And she said, but no, what I re realize is that you're the same person, you just have become more of yourself. And I thought, I actually think that's right. I think that one of the reasons why I am so proud of myself is not just because I escaped apartheid Mississippi and was able to get an education and become successful in life. It's because I have paid attention. I have paid attention. I am a great observer of my life and the lives of other people. And every day on that show, it was a classroom for people who were viewing, but it was a major classroom for me. And so I learned by watching other people's dysfunction, their struggles, their triumphs, celebrating in their joys, about the meaning of life and what it means to live a full and engaged life. And I learned that 
One of the most important things that everybody is looking for is to be validated, to be seen, and to know that they matter. And that no matter who you are, Barack Obama, the first time he came on the show as senator, he finished the interview and said, is that good? Is that all right? Good for you? Beyonce, when she finished doing, teaching me how to twerk, said, was that all right? When I interviewed a, a woman who had lost three of her children to cancer, she said, did I do okay? And what I realized is in, in one form or another, at the end of every conversation, people would say that. And I started to see the pattern and understood that what people really want is to know, did you hear me? Did you see me? And did what I say mean anything to you? And in recognizing that, I was able to become a better interviewer because I can give you that thing that you're looking for. I know how to help you be better in that seat, just as you're doing with us here today, be better in that seat and tell your story in a way that when you leave here, you got what you wanted. I would say be easy with yourself, be easy with yourself. And it's all gonna work out because one of the primary, I think, principles that has led me to success is intention. And I think clarifying the intention based on the principles that we set out and the guidelines and manual work that we set out in the book, clarifying the intention, your reason for being. I mean, we talk in the book about asking yourself the question about what you're willing to live for and what you're willing to die for. And getting clear on that, because that is really the real work of your life. Everybody's gonna find a job that's gonna be able to bring you money and you're going to be successful. You're gonna get all of that. But why were you really brought here? by whatever means you think you got here. Why are you really here? You've come here to serve and you've come here to love. And how are you gonna use your service in love, first and foremost to yourself, because you've got, the work is not to make yourself perfect, but to start to begin to make yourself whole. How are you going to do that? How do you fill yourself up to be a whole person? a full person of kindness, of grace, and being able to offer that into the world, along with all the wonderful skills you all are gonna have. How do you offer that into the world in service that lifts you up and allows you to meet the rising of your life and lifts other people up? And so changing the paradigm to how, not just what am I gonna do, but how am I going to serve how am I going to serve? And my prayer for myself since I was a little girl was God use me, God use me. And whether you believe in my God or your God or no God, the question is how can you be used in service with all this work you're putting in, all this stuff that you're doing, you're doing that for what? You're doing that to be of service, first and foremost to yourself, your family and your community, and then how do you push that out into the world? And if the world is 20 people, 20,000 people, 20 million people as it was with me every day, it does not matter. Because what really matters is that you're building legacy. And this is the greatest definition of legacy I ever heard. When I opened my school in South Africa for <coughs> young girls, one of them is here today, who's now grown in law school and starting work in New York. But I opened that school for girls who were like me. I grew up in rural Mississippi, no running water, no electricity. My grandmother and I on what I thought was a farm and I went back and realized it was just an acre. It was so big in my mind, I went back, oh, this is, this is not a farm. This is actually <laughs> just a yard. When, when I was growing up there, I had a dream for myself. I remember being out with my grandmother washing clothes in a big iron pot, because we didn't have a washing machine, of course, and her putting clothes on the line and saying, you better watch me, because one day you're gonna have to learn how to do this for yourself. And I will tell you that the voice inside myself that all of us have, that feeling, that spirit, that inner voice, that voice at four years old said, mm-mm, mm, -mm. <laughs> This is not gonna be my life. <laughs> but I had sense enough 
<laughs> not to tell my grandmother. I, I had sense enough not to say that out loud, but I could feel inside myself, uh-uh, I'm not gonna be doing this. And it turned out to be true. But what I do know now is what Maya Angelou told me about legacy. When I came back from opening the school, I said, Maya, the school is going to be my greatest legacy. These girls are amazing. And I, I can't even tell you the Oprah Winfrey Leadership Academy is going to be the great. She said, you have no idea what your legacy is going to be. I said, oh, no, I, I'm telling you, it's going to be these girls. You should have been there. You should have seen it. She was making biscuits at the time, and she put the dough down. When Maya puts the dough down, get back. She said, I said you have no idea what your legacy will be because your legacy is not your name on a building. Your legacy isn't even the lives of those girls. It's every life you touch. Your legacy is every life you touch and you are building your legacy here and now. So everything that you do going forward, every life that you encounter and experience and the way you treat yourself and the way you treat other people is building your legacy. So think about it in terms of the, the bigger goal and meeting the rising that is there waiting for you. And the fact that you've gotten here and all the things that you had to overcome means you've already won. So go forward, that's what I say. One of the challenges, especially when you're going through anything, is not allowing the emotions to take over you and to be able to separate the feeling from who you know yourself to be and being able to have that little space in between where you can be the observer of the feeling, when you can observe the feeling and not be absorbed by the feeling, you can feel it and then take the wheel for yourself. It's just like, you know, when I was eight years old, I memorized Invictus. And at the time I was reciting out of the night that covers me black as a pit from pole to pole. I didn't know what the hell I was talking about at eight years old, but I did know that the last stanza, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul, that had meaning for me even at eight years old. And so as I've grown into myself, become more of who I was meant to be, the mastery of that comes when you can separate those emotions and feelings from the who of who you are. So The Oprah Winfrey Show was on for 25 years, was the most successful television talk show in the history of all television. I did it for 25 years, never missed a day, never missed a day. And the reason it was the most successful is because around the second year of it, I changed the motivation and intention of the show. I went from just trying to be a talk show competing with everybody else in the rat race of ratings and literally sat down with my producers and said, how do we use this show as a force for good? How do we, and that came after doing three shows in a row. I'd done a show with the Ku Klux Klan, and I realized in the middle of that show that I wasn't helping anybody. I thought I was exposing their vitriol when in fact they were using their appearance on the show to recruit other members. And so I could feel that going on in the audience. And then another show that we did with on people who had infidelities and a husband had come on with his with his wife and his girlfriend. The producers were so happy that they got the husband and the wife and the girlfriend. And in the middle of that show, the husband humiliated his wife and said, she's pregnant on national television. And when that happened, I was so ashamed that that had happened on my platform. I said, this will never happen to me again. And I will never do a show like the Klan again. And so my producers were like, well, what are we gonna do? I said, we're gonna, we're gonna turn this around and we're gonna, nobody bring me an idea that you are not clear about what the intention is. And we are gonna only do shows that come from the intention of how can we best serve the audience. And I'm telling you, after every show, there was a meeting to say, did we serve the intention? Did we do what we said we wanted to do? And how can we do it better the next time? And that is when the joy the happierness, the level of satisfaction, the level of pleasure, and everything changed for me 
in doing that show. And it also when the numbers took off, all sort of happened at the same time. But it was because it was intentional and we were trying to use it as a service and not just as a show. My favorite quotes of all time is Martin Luther King, who says, not everybody can be famous, but everybody can be great because greatness is determined by service. And what I've found is no matter what it is you're doing for other people, no matter how tedious or menial the job may seem to you, that if you shift the paradigm of whatever your work is to how do I use this to serve? How can I be of service? Whether it's your talents, whatever it is you're offering, if it is offered in service, the shifting of the paradigm to I'm going to use this to serve makes a world of difference in the way you put that energy out into the world and the way that it comes back to you. That's what I learned from doing the show. My life is fueled by my being and the being fuels the doing. So I come from a centered place. I come from a focused place. I come from compassion. It's just, it's just my nature. I come from a willingness to understand and to be understood. And I come from wanting to, to connect. I mean, the secret of that show for 25 years is that people could see themselves in me. All over the world, they could see themselves in me. And even as I became more and more financially successful, which was a big surprise to me, I was like, oh my God, this is so exciting. <laughs> Got more than 30,000 by the time I was 30. So. But what, what I realized is through the whole process, because I'm grounded in my own self, that although I could have more shoes, my feet stayed on the ground, although I was wearing better shoes. So I could keep my feet on the ground, even though I could get more shoes. And I could understand, I could understand that it really was because I was grounded, was doing and continue to this day to do the consciousness work. I work at staying awake. And being awakened is just another word for spirituality, but spirituality throws people off and they think you mean religion. When I was hiring people for my company, looking for presidents, when people would come in, I'd say, tell me, what is your spiritual practice? And literally, people would go, I'm dumb. Well, the picture, I, well, I'm not religious. Or I said, I didn't ask you about your religion. I asked you, what's your spiritual practice? What do you do to take care of yourself? What do you do to keep yourself centered? What do you do to the... And, you know, one woman started crying, you know, that's not the person. Everything is fueled that comes from me really wanting to be a better person on earth. And this is what I know to be true. The reason why the show worked is because I understood that audience, my viewers, the people who watched us every day and would come and just like you all did, get tickets and they would come with their family. You all just came across campus, but that's good too. People would come from all over the world just to be there with their aunts and their mothers and they'd come with their cousins and there'd be a few men in there going, what the hell? Or saying, well, I went to Oprah with you. I went to Oprah and I ought to at least give me clear for three or four weeks, I went to Oprah with you. I had such regard for that. And I just had a conversation with John Mackey, who runs Whole Food and has written this fabulous book. You should get it called Conscious Capitalism. And he was talking about how the investment in the stakeholders, the people who you are serving, that connection between the people who you're trying to serve and sell to is equally as important as the people who you're buying from, right. equally as important as the people who are you know, supporting you financially as your stockholders if you are, you know, you know, a public company. So I always understood that there really was no difference between me and the audience. At times I might have had better shoes, but at the core of what really matters, that we are the same. And you know how I know that? Because all of us are seeking the same thing. You're here at this fabulous school and we'll go out into the world and each pursue based upon what you believe your talents are, what your skills are, maybe your gifts are, but you're seeking the same thing. Everybody wants to fulfill the highest, truest expression of yourself as a human being. That's what you're looking for. The highest, truest expression of yourself as a human being. And because I understand that, I understand that if you're working in a bakery and that's where you want to be, that may be what you've always wanted to do is to bake pies mm -hmm. for people or bake cakes for people or to 
offer your gift, then that's that's for you. And there's no difference between you and me, except that's how that's your platform. Mm -hmm. That's your show every day. So my understanding of that has allowed me to to, to reach everyone. And and there's no way that you wouldn't, because that's that's what I truly feel. I first came across this question, what happened to you, when I was doing an interview with Dr. Bruce Perry a couple of years ago for 60 Minutes story I was doing. Now, I've known uh, Dr. Perry for over 30 years. I first started interviewing him in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s on The Oprah Show, when we were talking about uh, raising children and how important it is those first zero to six years. So I've been hearing about what it means to nurture and support the brain early on. It wasn't until that conversation a couple of years ago. I don't know whether, I, I think it's because of where I was in my life at the time. I opened a school in South Africa. I've had these wonderful, brilliant girls who come from traumatic backgrounds grow up and have really serious mental health issues. And I was trying to, at the time, figure out what are we doing wrong at our school? Something's really wrong here. And in that interview with Dr. Perry, he said, you know, most people ask the question when kids are not behaving the way you want them to behave or what's wrong with them, we really should be asking about what's happened to you. It was like a major <laughs> moment, like I got it in a way that I hadn't received it before. And I realized that it's not just for children that you ask that question, but it's really everybody. And that moment, Bruce, as I've said to you many times, Dr. Perry, changed the way I saw my relationships, how I saw my own life, how I interacted with people, and even in politics where it was so crazy in the past four years and everybody's always talking about what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong. I would always say, I wonder what happened to that person. I wonder what happened to them younger that caused them to be this way. So all of the labels that you just gave, Jay, uh, there there is a world of labels. There is, you know, overachiever. There is, you know, obsessive compulsive moms, soccer moms. There is the desire to, you know, please people all the time. There's a multiple, 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 multiple labels that refer back to what happened to us. And so I will just say this, one of the things that Bruce says in the book, each of us comes into the world with our own worldview. And that worldview is actually shaped from the crib. And mm -hmm. you get from the world what you project into the world and you project into the world what you were raised with and what you were raised around. So that's why what happened to you is the essential question. The younger the children are, the more influence you have, not only on who they become, but on what their brain becomes. Because if you're surrounded by chaos and dysfunction and loudness and disorder at a zero to two months, it means the synapse in your brain doesn't form in the way that it does in children who have had that. And you are more likely for behavioral problems, health problems, all other problems in life, just because you didn't get what you needed from zero to two months. That is what is so amazing. I thought trauma prior to my conversations with Bruce in, in doing this book, I thought trauma had to be a big, gigantic thing, experience. You had to go through a tsunami, literally, a, if not literally a tsunami, a tsunami-like crisis in your life. A fire, a hurricane, a tragedy, a car accident, a stabbing, a, somebody died. And it was through co-authoring this book with him that I understood that it was the consistent little things. It was the aggressions and microaggressions in a person's life that causes them to have their own worldview whatever that worldview is for you is different from me. So the biggest, the biggest learning for me is that trauma doesn't have to have a great big old capital T on it. It's really how you were loved. And that neglect and trauma are hand in hand because both are equally as toxic. Over the years of interviewing people, it was my greatest classroom. I was always paying attention to what people were saying 
and paying attention to their lives. And what I understood and could articulate, not through science, but just through my own observation, is that, oh, people are as dysfunctional, as unhappy, as disoriented in their lives based on how far they are from the center of themselves. And the center is where wholeness lies, as you know. And so where there is no where there is no center and there is no sense of wholeness and love for yourself, there's going to be disarray, chaos, confusion, and, you know, dysfunction in your life. And I saw that over and over and over again, that people behave based on how they were loved and then how they were able to process that in, that, that in a way to love other people. Well, you start with understanding that your cup being full is how you allow yourself to give to other people. You, mm. you can't give what you don't have. You can't love if you haven't been loved. You don't even know how to begin to do that. So I think it begins with fundamentally understanding that you are worthy enough, you are valuable enough, you matter enough to give yourself the love that you deserve. And that starts by taking out time for yourself. So I have my own rhythm and pattern. I know that if I go six days and then on the seventh, by the seventh or eighth, don't give myself a break, that lots of other things give. That I'm not as alert, I'm not as attuned, I'm not as centered, I'm not as focused. So I know that that is, that is my limit. I cannot go beyond a certain amount of days. And for me, um, walking in nature uh, is my solace. It is where I feel that I am one with all and all being, you know, all creation and, you know, connected. For other people, it may be dancing, it may be music, it may be knitting, it may be whatever it is that brings some kind of rhythmic pattern into your life. Actually, it was Bruce and I were walking on my campus and. South Africa and uh, there were a group of girls dancing literally on the lawn because Lord knows they love to dance and Bruce says oh that's not just I said oh they're just having fun and Bruce said oh they're not just having fun they actually are healing themselves the rhythmic pattern that's why when you've been in an argument with someone or you are in the middle of an argument with somebody if you just go and take a walk or you go and turn on some music and you start dancing. If you just have some form of movement, you feel better. That's number one. Number two, one of the most important things, most, most important takeaways from what happened to you, I believe, is understanding how the brain works. And that diagram that's on page 26 or 27 about the in, inverted brain being like a triangle. So you see that beginning with the brain stem, that's the lower part of the brain, all the way to the cortex and through the limbic area, you understand that, um, you understand that when you're upset or in fear or angry or are in, in an antagonized state, and you're trying to reason with a person, a child, your spouse, your boss, your friend, they literally cannot hear you because the reasoning part of the brain is in the cortex and what you're saying is only reaching the brain stem. So whenever somebody is dysregulated, which is what that is, being ang anxious and fearful and yelling and screaming, the thing to do is to calm yourself first 
then you will be able to help that other person get calm and regulated. That's how you get to reason. But if you both are just yelling at each other, literally and you're going, you don't hear me and you don't hear me either. And you know, they actually cannot hear you. That's what I thought was so fascinating. I was in a boardroom having to confront someone in my 40s and I had so much anxiety about the fact that I was going to have to have this confrontation with somebody. N normal disagreements would cause me a great sense of angst and worry and oh my god and what's going to happen and I just said what where is this coming from? Why am I so afraid when I am the one in the power seat? I am Oprah Winfrey running the Harpo Studios, my name spelled backwards, I'm the person in charge, and in order to have a disagreement with somebody, I go through so much angst. And I realized, Jay, that even though I had the power, I still felt that every confrontation, I was going to get a whipping that a whipping was going to result. That, that wow. thing that, that used to come up inside me when I had to walk to get my own switch. Oh, where is this feeling coming? I'm feeling like in every confrontation, I'm going to get a whipping. And at the end of it, that person's going to be mad at me. And at the end of it, that person's going to say, you better not act like you're mad. You know, all the things that happened to me as a kid. So it wasn't until I was a full grown adult in my own seat of you know, perceived power, feeling those feelings of anxiety and anxiousness, having to have the slightest bit of confrontation. So what I say in what happened to me is that being beaten as a child, um, having to be subservient to other people's ideals of what it means to be a child, meaning you are seen and not heard. So I've grown up to have this big personality, but being raised in an environment where children are seen and not heard and your opinions do not matter. So what happened to me taught me that my opinions do not matter. Keep your opinions to yourself and do whatever you can to please other people so that other people will like you, so that other people will not be upset with you. And I will have to tell you, it is also for me, not for everybody else, but for me, one of the reasons why I was so susceptible to sexual abuse, because I had been taught and trained not to speak up for myself, that whatever somebody wanted to do who was older than me or in a position of authority, that they had rights I, that I did not. So that what happened to me was ingrained in a way that, you know, literally uh, caused me to be a major people pleaser for, for a great deal of my life. If you come into success and fame, and particularly fame, because fame is its own world and definition, because it really is based upon what other people think of you. So, because fame isn't what you think of yourself, it's what other people think of you. When, if you come into that and you don't have a grounded, centered self, you will be controlled by the outside instead of the inside. And if you come into that, not in the fullness of knowing who you are and what you're supposed to do with that fame, whenever somebody likes you or doesn't like you, that determines whether or not you're having a good day or a bad day. And you, are, you have lost control of your, your own life. So I think what fame teaches you quickly is to grow the wholeness within yourself so that you're not controlled by others outside opinions of you. I have people to me free, so I'll cherish every moment, every day, for your love has lit my path in every way. In the tender touch of your hand, I find the strength to rise and stand through every trial, every tear we've shed. Your love's been the shelter where I find my bed For your love's been my anchor in life's stormy seas A beacon of hope guiding me to be free So I'll cherish every moment Every day For your love has lit my path in every way With gratitude in my soul I'll sing for the love
that I trust. And one of the things that, if I may pat myself on the back for, is that I try to surround myself with people who are smarter than I am. I think that the ability to be as good as you can be comes from understanding who you are and what you can and cannot do. And what you can't do is far more important than what you can do if what you can't do is going to keep you from flying as high as you can. I think the most important thing to get ahead falls back to what, what I truly believe in, and that is the ability to seek truth in your life. And that's on all forms. You have to be honest with yourself. You can be pursuing a profession because your parents say it's the best thing. You can be pursuing a profession because you think you'll make a lot of money. You can be pursuing a profession because you think you're going to get a lot of attention. None of that will do you any good if you're not being honest with yourself. And the honesty comes from your, your natural born instinct will tell you when you're doing something whether or not this feels right. You feel a sense of accomplishment and fulfillment and worthiness to the world in such a way that you know you're doing the right thing. You don't have to ask anybody. When you're doing the right thing, you don't have to say, you think this is okay? It's like, and it works on every level, whether or not you're going to a party or you're choosing a dress or you're choosing a friend. If you ever have to say, you think this is okay? Chances are it is not because that's your instinct trying to get you to, to ask yourself that question. Maybe this isn't okay.